folks, and welcome to the podcast, Byzantium and Friends. I'm Anthony, your host. I hope you had a pleasant and relaxing summer, despite some of the heat that we had there for a while, and that you are pleasantly getting back into the swing of the fall. So if I were dividing this podcast into seasons, this would now be the fifth season, or let's say fifth academic year during which I'm doing this. It's been a while (laughs) since the fall of 2019. So we're going to kick off this season with a big topic. It's a very stimulating, explosive book um, by Peter Heather called Christendom, the Triumph of a Religion, A.D. 300 to 1300. Now, you might know Peter Heather as the author of many books, primarily on barbarians and empires. So (laughs) insofar as the period of of late antiquity or the early Middle Ages was defined by Gibbon as a period of barbarism and religion, And in fact, most of the scholarship on that period still continues to focus on barbarians, mostly in the West, and religion, mostly in the East. Um, A lot of the scholarship still is kind of operating within those two um, thematic areas. And Peter has done extraordinary work on the first one, and I did not know that he was preparing a major book on the second one. And it is now, now. Um, and it's definitely worth reading. It's very stimulating and provocative. And I will tell you quickly why. So it is very difficult to access the experience of early and medieval Christians. What we have are mostly texts written by educated, literate Christians that are articulating their beliefs and their identity um, in very provocative and original ways. In this literature, these texts proved very successful at capturing the narrative. Now, whatever else Christianity was doing on the ground, and some might argue that in shaping economies and societies and politics and warfare, it wasn't doing very much, but it was definitely very capable of uh, taking control of the narrative, especially of its own narrative and that of its rivals. And three themes that emerge very consistently in Christian literature are, first, the inevitability of Christianity. Not just of Christianity, but of the specific form of Christianity that the author adheres to. In other words, that there is a divine plan that leads to the supremacy of that version of Christianity over society and the displacement of rival religions or versions of Christianity. Second, the conversion of kings and by extension, through their conversion, that of society at large. In other words, Christian thinkers, missionaries, uh, martyrs, saints, whatever, capture political elites and thereby lead to the conversion of their peoples. And third, what I'll loosely call universalism, that is the idea that, that Christianity will take hold across the whole of society and personally, like on an individual level, at great depth, like it will transform the individual spiritually and morally. Now, Peter's book is a very provocative read because it pushes back against those three pillars. As a historian who's taking a kind of skeptical approach to how and how long it took for this religion to take hold, and so specifically against inevitability he foregrounds contingency. That what happened didn't happen because of some foreordained plan, but there were very many critical moments when a handful of decisions by just individuals put the whole sort of bed of the river um, onto a different track, and those living downstream, right, up of that river feel, of course, that the currents of history lead inevitably and naturally to them. But at the moment of that sort of deviation or detour, things were very much in the air. And we could have been living in a very, very different Christian world. Um, there are lots and lots of moments where the, um, you know, the timelines could have diverged. And, you know, and, anyway, So some of the key terms that we discuss here are Nicene versus Homian. These are rival versions of Christianity that were active 
and competing with each other from the 4th to the 6th centuries. Um, they have to do with how you view the relationship between the Father and the Son within the, the Trinity, uh, whether they are consubstantial or something else. Anyway, so those are doctrinal differences. We don't get into those kinds of differences, but rather the history that shaped which of them you know, won. Okay. Also, against the idea of Christianity converting kings, Peter foregrounds a recurring pattern whereby kings decide what version of Christianity or what religion is going to be uh, dominant or the only allowed one in their societies. And that, and, and this is a very uncomfortable topic uh, for many authors writing within the Christian tradition that often it is these secular rulers and emperors who make the fundamental decisions and that the churches fall in line. Um, so it's, it's not the case of the churches capturing political power, though that could happen, but there was also a dialectical process whereby the opposite could also happen and, and frequently did, and that the secular authorities could kind of dictate a lot of what later became sort of canonical Christianity. And the third, when it comes to universalism or the, the, the extension across space and, and, and social orders and the penetration sort of in depth of individual psyches. And here Peter argues that the evidence suggests that this was fairly limited for a very, very long time, that large numbers of people remain relatively untouched. Um, and insofar as they you know, came within the uh, orbit of the church, it was relatively superficial for a very long time. And so he would push later um, the dates at which we can talk about a, quote, monolithically Christian society or a profoundly Christian society or whatever. We're usually talking about a very few people who took the message very, very seriously and were and talking about it and writing about it and harping on it for, for, for a while before everyone else kind of caught up. Anyway, I love to read books that challenge our major preconceptions in this way um, and just provide alternative models um, for us to think uh, in. And, and, and Peter's done a, a, such a great job with empires and barbarians and the other side of the late antique equation uh, that I was very pleasantly surprised to see this uh, come from him. Okay, I'll stop there. One brief note that Peter also has another uh, a co-authored book coming out soon, or it's out already, called Why Empires Fall. Um, so I'll, I'll be very interested to look at that too, and hopefully we can discuss that on a later episode. Uh, but for now, let's get to the conversation on Christendom. Hello, Peter. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you so much for having me, Anthony. It's great to be here. Yeah. So it has been a long time since we spoke. As far as I know, the only time that we were in the same room was in November of 1994. Oh, you're kidding me. Yeah. When the, <laughs> the traveling circus of the Byzantine Studies Conference came to the block adjacent to where I lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Yeah, okay. And you spoke something about Ravenna? Yeah, about Theodoric. I, I know exactly the occasion, yes. <laughs> Was it memorable for you for other reasons? Um, well, it, it coincided with one of um, our trips to Dumbarton Oaks, um, and those uh, are stuck firmly in my brain. Um, my uh, in-laws, uh, lived in uh, Washington, D.C., in, in the winter at least. Okay. So it, it was always lovely when I was able to take uh, some time and get a fellowship at D.O. Uh, it, it's uh, you know, very happy family memories, those. Yes, and my uh, professor at the time at Michigan was John Fine. He said, you have to go see Peter Heather. So I did. Um, because He was very nice to me way before that and before you would have yeah. been there. Because uh, the first time I was at Dumbart Notes, when I was a pre-doctoral fellow, I was uh, spending, going to spend Christmas uh, with some old friends of mine. Uh, he was an anthropologist who uh, was teaching at Ann Arbor. And uh, to get the money back, I had to give a paper. And John Fine very kindly uh, allowed me to come and give a paper. He never heard of me, didn't know me from Adam. It was uh, it was very nice of him. And, uh, yes. I appreciate that very much. 
And since then, I have followed your work. And I have to say, I'm a big admirer. Um, there are two books of yours in particular, the Fall of the Roman Empire and the Empires and Barbarians books that I've used quite a bit. And if any in the audience hasn't read them, you should go and read them. I mean, those were very important books for me because they were on a very important topic that's sort of adjacent to what I work on, but not really what I work on. And I keep up with it. And I have to say, throughout all of the 90s and early aughts, it was difficult to make sense of what a lot of people were saying about those events. Um, and you clear things up with such... Anyway, I mean, your your analyses are very, very clear, and you use models that are ground, they're feet on the ground, in the sources. Um, and I'd like... so. Well, you know this better than anybody, but a lot of what we were reading during those years was so counterintuitive, like yes. almost deliberately so. And it, there's a point where there's an element of mystification. And I like what you said in Empires and Barbarians that you know, that uh, clarity and simplicity once used to be virtues in an argument and that we now value like making things more complicated than they need to be. Um, it, it, and, yeah. It really is a, the modern word, isn't it? Complexify. Yes. If anyone says they're going to make something more complex, yes. uh, that's immediately a sign that, oh my God, they're so clever. And, you know, this is a, a new order, but, you know, I, it, it should be taken with a pinch of salt. And my uh, alarm bells instantly go off when I hear those words. Uh, I have exactly the same uh, reaction. So I think of it in terms of intellectual defenses. Um, Anyway, so yeah, so you've written these really foundational works, um, and they 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 help clarify so much for me. And so in my mind, you're a you're a, you know barbarians, empires, armies, you know, kind of historian. And here you come out now with a book <laughs> on the first millennium of the history of Christianity in Western Europe, primarily. I had no idea that you were working on like medieval penitential culture <laughs> in such depth. So. Can you first tell us how you got to this topic? So, I mean, what what were the the what problems were you trying to work out that you reached this? Yes. So, my convoluted intellectual formation is that I go to Oxford as an undergraduate in the summer of well September, actually October. The term starts late of 1978. Peter Brown has just left Oxford the year before. However, everybody who uh, taught me uh, at every level had been taught by him or attended his lectures. So uh, the religious history of late antiquity uh, is a buzz still. I mean, they're all, they're all talking about him and they're all talking about his work and they all set his work for me. So, and to be honest, um, that's what made uh, the undergraduate studies uh, so exciting. Uh, is the buzz that his work was generating mm. and, and which was still there. Uh, a whole series of people. Um, and my intellectual formation is a mix of ancient historians and medieval historians. They'd all been sucked into his orbit by the sheer force of the energy of his intellect and the originality of what he was saying. So it was really exciting. Um, so, you know, if you looked at my undergraduate exam papers, they're full of religious history. <laughs> uh, so it's all been bubbling away there ever since. And of course, I've been teaching it for as long as I've, I've been in post. Um, I went down the barbarians route uh, because um, it seemed to me there were two ways to do um, social history in late antiquity. Um, something a bit broader based. And I, I went to Oxford thinking I was going to do 19th and 20th century history. I am a modern historian gone backwards. Um, so I was interested in these very broad things. One was uh, through the Christian religious sources, uh, but you know there wasn't any space in there that I could see because the, mm -hmm. the Brownian energy is, was so intense and he filled up the space. Um, and how do you follow that, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, or barbarians, which I thought were very interesting. The other, we weren't, use, we weren't using the term the other yet. This is, you know, yes. 1978, but we were effectively thinking it. Um, 
that's yeah. uh, so I ended up in, in that route. Uh, I uh, said to my then supervisor, the great Byzantinist James Howard Johnson, I'd like to work on barbarians, but I don't know which ones. <laughs> 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 and he pointed my nose in the direction of some sources which he thought were under read um, oh, the, the, the fragmentary classicizing historians of the 5th century uh, as Blockley was uh, busy um, recataloging and, and re-editing and translating uh, and he was right there was uh, stuff in there that kind of generated my doctoral thesis yes um, in fact over the years I noticed that there's sort of distinct trends in people who work on different barbarian groups. And like this, you get a different feel from those who work on Goths, from those who work on Franks, from those who work on Huns. Like they have slightly different, anyway. <laughs> um, well, my other pet theory is that historians actually end up in topics that suit their personalities. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that's the trend you're noticing. But... <laughs> okay. <laughs> we won't ask, you know, it's be best not to ask sometimes. <laughs> All right. So in your case, one does, you know, barbarians when you're young, your hair's long, and now you turn to religious culture when you're getting older. Yeah, that's right. It's a reflection on mortality. It, uh, it comes to everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, so this book, so it's difficult to overstate just how much it does and the originality of the arguments in here. Um, and some of them are very specific arguments, but some are uh, broader approaches that you bring to uh, different, you know, periods. And it, so I'll mention a few in particular that a subject, so starting with elites, but working its way down the social scale, tend to fall in line with what their emperors or rulers or kings decide about religion. And event, you know, and this is a major mechanism of conversion on a long scale. Um, and that's one. Another is just how contingent the history of Christianity was. Um, so, you know, between 300 and 1200, roughly the period you're looking at, that, you know, accidental events played a major role in shaping, you know, what doctrines prevails, institutions, and so forth. And that we're looking at it from the end uh, you know, the, the result of that process, we look back and historians of Christianity have tended to normalize those processes as being inevitably pointing to the group that prevailed. Um, and, and so you, you write that um, history with hindsight. Um, I mean, not you, but this has traditionally been done. Um, can we start with that um, aspect of your argument, the, 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 the contingency um, and, you know, how you know, some cases where things could have gone a different way or, and here's the more interesting thing that I was thinking in reading your book, that they did actually go the different way. And that's the Christianity that we happen to know. And like an alternate universe would have been completely different. Yes. Uh, no, it, it makes you think of parallel worlds. Uh, absolutely. And uh, uh, some of those films that explore um, all the different uh, potential universes that are created by human decision making and maybe they are really out there maybe there is a Hamoyan universe uh, that exists uh, yes uh, absolutely I, what made me think about that a lot um, is reading a lot of the material because the early medieval age the only medieval period is one of conversion you know uh, at the start of it um, only a little bit of the European landscape is Christian by the end of it, a lot of it is. Um, but uh, when people write about it, they keep using Christianity as a singular noun, as though we know what it is, uh, we know what it does, and it's the same everywhere. Uh, and actually looking very, you don't have to look very hard at the sources, it becomes very clear it's different things in different places. Uh, and that's really the first observation um, that uh, it is a very misleading singular now, Christianity. Um, what, what it means in practice, what is required of believers is incredibly different in different places uh, at different moments. And, you know, uh, the, the starting thing going a bit later and a bit more Western than the interests of most of your audience, but just to make the point, there were no churches 
before 900 across the rest of Europe. I mean, virtually no choice, virtually no churches. 5,000 blasted churches are built in England between uh, 900 and 1,200. Before that, there's one every, you know, 10 miles. Yeah. And that means, you know, no one's going to church because you don't walk, you know, 20 miles there and back again to go to church. So what Christianity means in a context with no trained priests and hardly any churches is totally different from what it then comes to mean in the 13th century when there is a church in every settlement. And, yes. Uh, so, it, so it was starting from that kind of perspective and then working my way backwards um, to think about um, the late Roman period, which, of course, is where I was born and brought up as a, as a scholar uh, and thinking about the history there. Uh, and again, I thought it was, uh, and I've, I've taught it really, you know, you were asking about, you know, how I got onto Christianity. Uh, the 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 uh, the bare bones of the argument about um, how Christianity is transformed in the fourth and fifth century is there in lectures that I'm giving in the early nineties. Mm. Um, so I, yeah, I hope the hope they're better now than they were in the early nineties. But <laughs> as it were, the bottom line is already there that uh, we're seeing the move from a very small sect of true believers to a mass religion, and there's a whole series of um, changes that that come with that yeah um, so this new model and i have to stress just how new it is because historians of early christianity have kept to a very traditional model until very very recently i think the balance is tipping now and the traditional model being that there's like this one line there's a there's a thread of kind of real authentic christianity that yes. starts you know new testament times and Groups branch off and splinter, but though you know, providence basically brings it about that they don't prevail. And here we are, whoever we are, whoever we are, it's the same narrative, even if you're a different group, right? Yeah, sure. And That's the new true. model is more like, no, from the beginning, there were lots of variant versions, and they never converge fully, and they just go off in their own directions. Um, and so, you know, and and contingency impacts. How whether a group will survive long term or, or or not, and one of the more fascinating arguments that you had in the book, and and I got to give it to you, I knew all of the information that you yeah, used, sure, in the chapter, yeah. <laughs> but I never actually put the pieces together in a way to see it like that, right? That in the you know fourth fifth centuries in the in Western Europe and North Africa, it looks like the version of Christianity that you call Homian for our audience. This is a, a version of the broader umbrella of, quote, Aryan Christianity, though it's not called that by anybody who believes it, um, was looking pretty dominant in the West. And there were just like a couple of events that, you know, bent the arc back to Nicene Christianity. Can you talk a little bit about like where and when and who? who, who what are those events? I think they're, they're kind of, Two critical moments. And perhaps um, the, the background in my head is actually what happens in the uh, eastern provinces that are conquered by Islam, where uh, eventually, um, after two, three generations, you see substantial elite conversion from Christianity to Islam. Um, and, and quicker in some places, slower in others, but um, that model does, generally speaking, prevail uh, in the conquered provinces. And it, it was thinking about that, you know, the, the, what happens when a new dominant cultural, religious cultural model comes to town and it's not shakeable um, that set me thinking about this because there is a moment um, around about 500 when nearly every royal court that's emerged um, in Western, what was the Western Empire, has these Aryan Homoian rulers. Um, and there's only one who eventually decides not to do that, which is Clovis. And he eventually goes for Nicene Christianity. But the, the great thing that's become clear 
uh, is that Gregory Tours' narrative about Clovis is just wrong from every dimension. But that is, you know, Gregory is writing in the last quarter of the sixth century, he's looking back nearly a century. And you have a, a more contemporary source. We have an exactly contemporary source. Someone, someone who was invited to Clovis's baptism. <laughs> you know, there's a thought. Bishop yeah. Abbotus of Vienne is invited to Clovis's baptism. He, he didn't go. Why did he not go? So, <laughs> missing the party of the century. You know. But uh, uh, he makes it clear, well, two things. One, Clovis is only baptised late, after he's won all his victories, not before. And secondly, that he'd been hovering between Homoian Christianity and Nicene Christianity. And that's the really, and that makes a lot of sense because two of his uh, sisters are Homoian Christians. They then come back to Catholicism. Uh, but you suddenly have a sense, oh my God, Clovis could really have become a Homoian Christian. It was really possible. Mm -hmm. That was absolutely on the cards. And if he had, then every court in uh, the former Western Territory, I mean, apart from Britain, where they're still up yeah. in trees eating bananas. But, you know, that's fine. <laughs> Acorns, <laughs> I think. Yeah. That's Britain, you know. We're, yeah. we're always uh, in some strange uh, uh, cul-de-sac. Uh, anyway, um, they would all have been Hamonic Christians, which would then have mimicked the what happened in the conquered territories of the Eastern Empire, eventually, where you had a dominant religious cultural model, a new one, uh, all of court life was anchored around the dominance of that um, model. Uh, it seemed God chosen because it had won, um, and elites would start uh, feeling. You only have to have the perception there that you might get a slight advantage by choosing this um, model for then a drip, drip of conversion to come until eventually you've reached a critical mass. And the model is quite straightforward. Once you reach the critical mass, then suddenly you start getting laws which put in place that those who don't come in line with the new model um, are second-class citizens. Uh, and I suddenly sort of started to smell that that really could have happened. Um, and and in, in particular, it could have happened, I think, because we haven't spread Christian, we haven't spread any form of Christianity through the mass of the population yet. I think once you've done that, there's much more resistance. Mm. And there, there are hard points that make it much more difficult to shift. Although I do think, as you said, that the story of Christianization sees a lot of top down. I think there's a very interesting um, feedback loop that once you have firmly converted the mass of the population, then you've stuck a lot of inertia against further change into the system. But that, 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 that's a separate story. So the conversion of Clovis, I think, is, is one of those moments. And it looks to me as though he's really choosing Constantinople over Theodoric. Um, his sister had married Theodoric at some point, late 490s maybe. Um, but eventually he decides the town ain't big enough for both of them. And he's going to, he will make himself independent of Theodoric's hegemony, and he chooses, uh, for whatever reasons, a Constantinopolitan alliance. And I think he takes Nicene Christianity with that. So that, that undercuts the moment where there might have been this totality. Uh, and the second one, I think, is the, uh, what looks to me the entirely contingent choices of Justinian, uh, desperate for success to roll the dice in the Western Mediterranean um, after Nico and after the defeat uh, against the Persians. Um, you know, Constantinople's a smoking ruin. Uh, his claim to be a, a God-chosen emperor looks pretty ropey. Uh, he's, you know, the classic, well, we've seen it all too recently, uh, the classic um, tyrant ruler looking to re-establish their reputation with some overseas success and it works <laughs> and you you do get the strong sense from Procopius and uh, actually the the preambles to the relevant legal materials in the novels as well that they're all absolutely flabbergasted that they roll up the Vandal Kingdom in about seven months you know they say oh my god it worked <laughs> 
And then they kind of think, oh, well, having done it once, we can do it again in Italy. That'd be great. <laughs> but uh, 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 the combination of those two campaigns eventually destroys the Visigoth, uh, sorry, the Vandal and the Ostrogothic kingdom. Uh, and with the Franks already being um, Nicene Christian and having taken advantage of the a uh, new situation of Justinian's reconquest in Italy to roll up the Burgundian kingdom, which they do in the early 530s, uh, instead of having a whole slew of uh, Homoian Aryan kings in control of the West, there's only the Visigoths left. And they eventually um, reach the conclusion that God is not on their side. Yes, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating reconstruction. And it works especially because the West, even at that time, was not very Christianized in the countryside, like you said. But I think the example of what happens in the East and Islam, you know, I think would make the argument work even if those provinces were more Christianized. Yeah. I was always struck by this, you know, and again, reading your book you brought this out again that uh, scholars who work on the late antique East and will talk about the, you know, deep and profound Christianization of like Syria and Egypt and all these places. And they use all of these adjectives, you know, which are like, you know, placeholders for any kind of quantification because we don't have it. Sure. And the culture is supposed to be like completely permeated by Christian ways of thinking and deep identities that are held fast and so forth. And then once the Arabs come along, they stop paying attention. Like the scholarship just doesn't continue there. And and the two and a half centuries later, you see that, well, no, that's all been rolled back. Yes. And now it's majority Muslim. And I was thinking, so wait a minute, what happened to those deeply held identities that are sort of ingrained, you know, dyed in the wool kind of, no, oh, you know, they changed. Yeah, no, so, I, I totally agree with you. Yeah. yeah. So this can happen. Uh, and, you know, the, the, the scholarship has this tendency to look at the cases that satisfy the model. The, the most. Yes, I think that's true. And I think the other thing um, that people don't think about enough, which reinforces, I think, your line of thought, is the transmission mechanism for texts. You know, what do we know? How do we know? Well, nearly everything has been copied by medieval Christians, both in the East and the West. That's why we have it. So um, we're getting the kind of maximal religious view yeah. of what's going on absolutely yeah. and I, I do think that that is the kind of methodological problem that is underlying the history of writing the religious history of late antiquity it's because you know uh you're it's about augusta because augustine writes confessions yeah. so you know this is what a late antique christian like he's like augustine you know it's yes. uh, it's intense, it's thought about uh, with great care, it's a long, tortuous story, it's uh, total conviction, complete life change, it's all of these things. Um, but actually, you know, well, I used the, the example of <laughs> this joker who turns up in the, the letters of Julian, you know, a couple of lines, yeah. he'd been bishop, Pegasios, he'd been bishop of Ilios, he clearly sent in a report that he destroyed the temples because Julian goes there expecting to find them wrecked. Julian turns up, Pegasus has looked after the temples, gives him a personal guided tour and uh, everything's in good shape. And the reason we know about this is that Pegasus later asked for a job in Julian's pagan priesthood. Now, what on earth did Pegasus believe? Uh, I have no idea, and no one else has got any idea either. You know, there are, there are all kinds of more and less complex constructions you can put on that. But you know, the, the fundamental point is that where the scholarship is kind of assuming that Augustine is more typical than Pegasius. Mm. Really, do we know that? Mm. Think about the, the transmission system and its selectivity, particular selectivity. It's very unclear that that's true. Very unclear, I think. Yes. Um, I have my own compliment to your theory, and this, this is about the East, and that is about why the East went Nicene, mm. right, in, in the late 4th century under Theodosius. Because, so I think about it in this term, in these terms, 
the Eastern and the Western churches, that is Latin and Greek, in the fourth century, were essentially in schism. The yes. West was Nicene, the East was not. And, and the East is where more, more Christians were. And the only reason Theodosius was able to roll this back, and he's from the West, so he's a Nicene, is because the Battle of Adrianople, so to come back to your, your former life, the Battle of Adrianople had wiped out the emperor and the top you know, uh, command staff of the Eastern Army, and Valens was the emperor who had, I think, successfully settled the Eastern Church around this kind of Homian consensus. Not only that, that it, the battle discredited his position, but Theodosius was lucky in that when he convened the Council of Constantinople in 381, he was able to not only appoint a bishop for Constantinople, but also for Antioch and Alexandria, because there happened to be vacancies. Mm -hmm. And the, the problem with the Nicene position is that they were fractured, right? So in the 370s, they were, they were not talking to each other. Yeah. Basil of Caesarea and the Pope and Alexandria, they, were, they, don't, they didn't like each other. They didn't trust each other. And so Theodosius is able to appoint people to fill those positions at the council. And they are, of course, very you know, beholden to him. And so they forge a Nicene consensus because he told them to. And, and that was that. And it, it's anyway, he got lucky. Yeah, I, I, I strongly think you're right. And you, know, you mentioned before the way that um, the traditional history of Christianity is talking about deviations from a norm. Mm. It clearly can't be right. You, you know, um, if you think about um, how long it took to generate consensus around the homoousion, likeness of substance or identity of essence, a definition of the relationship between the father and son after Nicaea, that makes no sense if that's what everyone had always believed. The fact that you have to go for two or three generations of really quite tortured argumentation and that it is in the end uh, brought to a conclusion by very top-down action and uh, some some tremendously stiff legal penalties as well to reinforce it. it. It just makes it clear that people weren't clear. I mean, they knew that Christ is God and man, uh, but you know the fundamental problem there is that the the core texts, the Gospels, give you very different images of what the relationship between the the Father and the Son is. You know, you've got the Gospel of John. Uh, in the beginning was the word and the word was god and the word was and the word was with god you know that that's the roots of a kind of nicene homoousion definition but then you've got in the synoptic gospels you've got christ in the garden of gethsemane saying not my will but thy will be done uh, and you know this is uh, the, the problem is is uh, everyone agreed by the end of the second century that those four gospels were the best gospels, but they then had to kind of work out yeah. how do we make them agree with one another? And you can see that there are perfectly um, reasonably, perfectly reasonable intellectual, in intellectual terms, different ways of putting those together. And I think, you know, uh, it was one of those intellectual problems that uh, as long as you didn't say anything too weird, people just didn't worry about it before the fourth century. But in the fourth century, we've come to this uh, point of um, creating a, a positive reading. There's one right way to read the relationship between these Gospels, and there's one right way to understand um, the relationship of the Father and the Son, and this is it. And that, that changes the ballgame. Another thread that runs through your book, it, we've talked about it already, is how elites tend to fall in line with the religious preferences of their rulers, and, you know, socially, this has a, you know, downstream effect on, on lower social classes. Um, and a major argument in the book about this is Constantine. Um, and here, of course, you, um, you, you, you have to engage with the scholarship on, you know, the before and after Constantine. And there's some demography involved, you know, what numbers of Christians are we talking about? Um, obviously, there's been a strain of scholarship that wants to see more Christians before Constantine, because that makes those conversions look more like Augustine's and Pegasus. Yes. <laughs> and so forth. 
Um, yeah. And I'd, I'd like to, I'd like you to talk a little bit about that, maybe in connection with Constantine and Christianization, but I wanted to tell you a sort of an experience on my part. And the argument resonated with me perfectly. And I've been thinking about this for a very long time. So I grew up in Greece and there was a while when I went around to like all the archeological sites in the museums. <laughs> and there's this figure that kept appearing in the museums. And this is statues of Antinous, who was the lover of the emperor Hadrian. Yes. And it turns out, I think that we have more statues of Antinous than any other human being from antiquity, <laughs> except possibly Hadrian himself, which are scattered all over the, you know, the Mediterranean and Europe and so forth. And the reason we have those statues is because Hadrian basically ordered the empire, now you will worship Antinous, my boyfriend, as a god after he had died. And everyone said, okay, <laughs> and they did. And for me, this is just, it was just such an <laughs> obvious example that, you know, if the emperor says, worship my dead boyfriend as a god, I go, you know, whatever, if he, wants to, if he wants to be a god, that's fine. Um, and so it's it's not that surprising to me that Constantine would say, okay, I'm a Christian now. And everyone is like, oh, me, I also am a Christian. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Funny you should say that, Emperor. <laughs> <laughs> My conscience has been pricking me for some time on this yes. matter. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, uh, it, in the end, it's a kind of interesting argument about what the public life of the late Roman Empire was like. Um, and there, there is, you know, it does relate to the kind of stuff that I've always worked on yeah. or written about in the sense of, you know, does the Roman Empire and its disappearance matter? Uh, it's not that I think I should hasten to add in case anyone's worried about it. But I think the late Roman Empire is a wonderful place. I don't. But I think it's a very um, important place. Uh, to the people who live in it, and that the way that it operates constrains and shapes the way that people have to live and the choices that they make. And in that sense, its disappearance is important because it kind of alters the ball game, the parameters within, within which they're working. And um, particularly in relation to elites, um, then when you start looking at it, you realize that there are some really key things in terms of your tax assessments, in terms of the security of your landed property, um, in terms of your ability to uh, get the right whisper in the ear of someone of influence uh, within the system, um, where it's not quite the empire. I think it is the public life of the empire and the way that the, the private interests of the individual intersect with the system of public life that's there, that you really do have to engage with it um, in order to maximize your position. Um, you know, it's a bit like one party state systems now. You have to be connected into them in order to protect yourself. If you're not connected into them, you are fair game. And there's someone out there who wants your stuff and they will find a way to get it. You know, there's loads of examples of that in the material that comes down to us. Um, and if you put into that the fact that um, it, this one-party state has its ideological component in religious terms, and that ideological component goes through a dramatic change which stabilizes for a couple of generations in the constant and more in the Constantinian dynasty and beyond, then the pressure will be on to uh, make sure that you can't be viewed as part of the ideological other, because you will then lose your capacity to um, make those key connections that um, protect you in lawsuits, that make sure that your uh, tax assessments are the lowest possible that you can get out of the system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it came it came back to to thinking about. Um, what was important to people, especially members of the elite, about uh, the Roman imperial system. It's an ideologically driven one-party state. You know, you could no more uh, criticize the Communist Party in China than you could criticize the religion of a reigning Roman emperor as a rich person and expect to get away with it, you know, not in the longer term.
that's that's the kind of model that's in my head and that's where, where i come from on that yeah and i don't think that they would have been inclined to criticize the religion of the emperor in any case um and you know of all people i think we academics should understand how sort of structured incentives get people to say things that they wouldn't <laughs> otherwise yes. right? like i've seen this again and again where the administration rolls out some package of you know, goodies that you can only access if you frame it within the rhetoric of this or that or the other thing. And suddenly all my colleagues who had never used those words before are now suddenly all on board with whatever initiative this is. And and I think that's the important thing that like they they don't care really that much about that packaging. They they want the the things, they want the connections, they want to get ahead, they want to be close to power, they want um, it, it's not like they're like secretly, you know, the crypto pagans who hate Christianity and what like they, whatever they don't anyway. No one's really checking on what they do at home anyway. Um, uh, no, I think that that's exactly the way I understand it. I mean, I take it in every generation there are. Well, you can see it, can't you, in the materials that come down to us, say from the Athens Academy or the Alexandrians. There are convinced uh, non-Christians who will fight their corner sure. uh, ad infinitum but yeah. they're clearly not very numerous and they're not yeah. they're not typical uh, most other people uh, can make some kind of accommodation as you say no one's really looking very closely at what goes on at home uh, and i do think um a lot of uh, actual religion if we were able to get past the selective lens of our christianizing and christian transmitted sources and see what people were really doing at home you would find a syncretic mixture that there would be certain elements mm. of christian values christian uh, beliefs and christian behaviors that were bolted onto things that was simply not compatible with with those and people wouldn't worry too much about it though you know i've uh, colleagues who oh, I had one oh, well very able colleague works on Greek religion um, who's convinced actually what you need to look at is behavior not beliefs you know what do people actually do <laughs> because what's in their heads is kind of any old amalgam of stuff a slightly random amalgam of stuff that they've picked up with their own uh, individual uh, agency thrown in on top so you know it's not belief that matters it's actually how do they behave what behaviors do they do and you know yeah. um, in that kind of context the uh, coming into line with uh, the christianness of emperors and of senior officials um, is maybe not that difficult yeah and i like the fact that you frame this um as the romanization of christianity um which is uh, because Okay, this is important because the traditional narrative has been the Christianization of Rome yes. and where Christianity is assumed to be the dominant um, force and Rome gets into line. And I think that there's much, much more that we can say on the Romanization of Christianity side. Um, in fact, in the, the this big history of Byzantium that I'm writing in the in the beginning, there's an argument about precisely how Christianity becomes a Roman religion. Um, when before Constantine, it was you know, talking and acting in ways that were not, uh, but Constantine and his successors make it compatible with the Roman understanding of what a religion is mm. um, and and change it in some pretty important ways. Um, so I think this is an area where a lot more research can be done. Um, and you know, especially if you compare... Christianity or the many Christianities of this time with Islam. And you realize that Islam, at least in the beginning, ver was very much the dominant force in relation to any state that adopted it. Um, and that this was just not the case in, in, in the Christian domain. And that's in part because of what I think Constantine did to it. Um, I mean, not that he was doing the only thing that he knew to do, which was being a Roman <laughs> emperor. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, so I I have this sense that it was not what Eusebius wanted, uh, but you can see Eusebius get into line once it happened. I, I think you can trace that in his writings. But that's a that's another anyway. No, that's very interesting. We've created a monster. <laughs> what have we done? That would be 
uh, a fascinating lens to look at it. Uh, I mean, you see, this does say, doesn't he, that you know, it's Constantine who suggests homoousios. Yes. The answer. <laughs> is that true? Uh, if it is true, then Constantine is personally responsible for sixty years of chaos in the <laughs> in the Christian circles. <laughs> Um, no, he. I don't think he fully understood what he was getting into. Uh, I, I'm sure that's right. Yeah. I'm sure that's right. I I remember what it suddenly brought to mind um, is that I used to trudge through all these East European um, archaeological journals um, looking for stuff about Goths and Huns, which I had to do. Um, and then there was a volume of the uh, Hungarian Scientific Academy from the early 50s uh, which uh, I directed to one paper which had something interesting in it and I looked at the preface and it was, the whole thing was dedicated to the uh, anthropological theories of Comrade Stalin. Mm. <laughs> I didn't know Comrade Stalin had anthropological theories. Oh, yes. <laughs> and this entire volume celebrated it. I mean, they did, uh, they were very clever. They did other things under the radar, but they knew that uh, to be allowed to do the other things they wanted to do, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, you know where I came across this? So now there's a very good Oxford book on the history of Byzantium, the city before Constantine by Russell. Um, but before yeah. that, there there was nothing. Um, so if you wanted to, this got thousand years of the history of this Greek city state on the Bosporus. Where do you look? And there was a book in German. Um, I think it was published in you know East Germany. Um, by a scholar who, I don't know, might have been Eastern, might have been Polish, might have been Russian, I don't know, but it was in German. Yeah. And and I'm like, okay, great. I'm like, I need to have this history filled in. I need to know what, what's, what's going on. And it starts with pages and pages of praise of Stalin and like how his theories are just like the best for writing the history of this ancient fishing town. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on? You mean you didn't believe it, Anthony? Come on. <laughs> and then it magically disappears and you just start getting archaeological data. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, you know, so, people do what they have to do. They do what they have to do. They absolutely do. And uh, But for the grace of God, go we. You know. so. so we focused on parts of the book that are you know, most closely adjacent to East Roman history. Um, I want to say for the benefit of the audience that your book actually goes really deep into, you know, Anglo-Saxon England and all the way down to the Crusades and the emergence of the papal state and papal ambitions in the uh, early 13th century. Um, and you spend a lot of time on England and in particular the the adaptation of Christianity to local norms there. Um, which now, so this is a society that, as far as I can tell, has basically reverted back to like a Homeric, like a heroic state. Yeah, I think you're, you're probably not far wrong. You know. <laughs> and the Christianity that emerges there is like completely different. Like it, it, it has to facilitate these heroic values, and it's just very, very different. Um, so, did you put that in to highlight exactly this sort of contrast between? the more sort of scribal theological Christianity that we get in the later Roman Empire and the the heroic societies that, you know, have to be Christian, but also, you know, gain glory on the battlefield by slaying your enemy or what, what? Yes, I, I, I wanted to put it in. I mean, again, we're looking at my own intellectual formation. Uh, English History One is a compulsory ah. paper in 1978 uh i'm born and cut my teeth on this stuff so it's been uh, it's been with me ever since then bead and uh, uh my first experience as an undergraduate straight from a normal uh english um state school is sitting in a dark room in one of these it's a 14th century uh, building a uh, new college in oxford uh, trying to translate bead, and every time you make a mistake, the uh, the teacher uh, Eric Christensen, great Viking historian, oh, says yes. next. 
next. <laughs> so it, it reminds me, my son made me watch Whiplash. I don't know if you've seen it. No. Uh, it's about jazz drumming, and you've got this ferocious teacher who makes people. Oh, yes, excellent. yes. It was Simmons. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It makes people become excellent uh, by every time, even if they're doing it right, he makes the next one come on. So you, you work even harder. It was precisely that kind of experience. Um, Wait, were you uh, translating bead from the Latin or the Anglo-Saxon? Uh, Latin. Beads only, beads only in Latin. Yeah. So I read that in... No, no, there's a, there was a translation. It, there's a translation done later. Yes. Yeah, I read that. Right, all right. That's a very particular thing to have read. I, well, I went through an old English phase. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in part because I thought it would be easy and there's not that much to read. <laughs> <laughs> No, no, I did. I, I remember. I can, I can recite parts of Beowulf. Uh, I still. Um, no, it's great, and I still try to keep up. Um, I had Rob, uh, Robin Fleming on. Oh yes. Uh, yep. The yeah, and I just read. Um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Sh uh, Shippy, um, um, who wrote on like a little book that, that Arc Humanities Press published on Beowulf and its setting. And oh its yes, 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 yes. yes. Yeah, no, no, I mean, it's wonderful stuff. It's absolutely wonderful stuff. But uh, yeah, so I've always loved it, but it did seem, you know, even in literature published within the last 10 years, um, there are exceptions, I hasten to say. But in, even in literature published in the last 10 years, you got people saying, well, Christianity comes along and does this, as though we know what Christianity is and that yeah. you can ascribe things to it. Uh, and, uh, it's true in the late Roman period, but it's less obvious in the late Roman period that Christianity adapts to whatever audience uh, it's engaged with in conversion periods, unless you're looking at uh, a brutal militarized conversion, maybe like South America under Spanish rule, which I've never studied. I mean, I know there are elements of syncretic uh, absorption even there, but yeah. you know that is a that's a different kind of model. It's not. It's not one that applies to any of the early medieval contexts, really, except Charlemagne and Saxony, I suppose, is the closest model there. Yeah. But, it, but you know, whenever you don't have that kind of brutal conquest model of, of Christian conversion, then it, conversion is always a two-way street, and you're always absorbing things from the new target audience to make the religion work. And, you know, it shouldn't work for Anglo-Saxon warriors, you know, turning the other cheek. Right, <laughs> right. Should really be a big problem, but it's not a big problem, you know. And uh, we find a way. <laughs> what can I say? I mean, I live in the country where Jesus is pro-gun and pro-oil and uh, yeah. pro-tax yeah. cuts. Yes, so, uh, I, mean, I can see you can make the God of the Old Testament do that, but it's it's a real stretch to make Jesus do it. I mean, yeah, the Old yeah. Testament is always the get-out, really, isn't it? Because you can go back there and there's all kinds of smiting going on that's fine you can find anything and as you know the the Ulfilas didn't translate the book of kings into gothic <laughs> it was too martial <laughs> anyway yeah, um, okay uh peter this has been a wonderful conversation i think we should wrap it up here uh, could you tell us a little bit more like what's next for you um well there, there are two things going on um, I've just published last Thursday uh, a little book with a friend of mine who's a modern political economist, and it has the snappy little title of Why Empires Fall, oh. Rome, America, and the Future of the West. But there, uh, there is an American com edition coming from Yale in the fall, so there is a, a separate American tradition. Okay. Um, but uh, he and I have been writing this together for a long time. It, it's sort of complete accident that it and Christendom happened at the same time, you know, that's just the way it was. But what I'm, what I'm really working on now um, are Vikings. That's where my... <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, go on. <laughs> yes. Well, I've always been interested in Viking ships and logistics and maritime connection. Um, and I've managed to persuade a lovely guy who is the curator of the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo to work with me on this. Oh. And uh, what I want to do uh, is put ships back at the center of the story, which is where I think they should be. Um, and the sort of way where 
we pretty much worked out the outline, but the chapters will be the roots and how they're developed, you know. Um, how did Vikings find out uh, which Russian river led where? How did Vikings work out where you can get to in the interior of England? Why does Viking settlement take a different uh, mode in England compared to, um, say, Ireland? You know, so thinking about chapters in terms of roots and thinking about um, the the logistics and, and difficulties of, of actually sailing, but also thinking about then the host societies that you encounter. Um, so that, uh, that's that's what I want to give you. It gives me great excuses. So I spent the first two weeks of April tracking through the Outer Hebrides. Looking at my <laughs> <laughs> it was bloody chilly, but it was wonderful. My head has not really returned, but my, my imagination is still full of it at the moment. <laughs> now, see, if you had chosen to work on Greek islands, you would have had very different research experiences. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, um, I do want to work, when I retire, I'm going to work on the Bronze Age transition so that I can just stay. <laughs> perfect. Oh, I just <laughs> did that. Yeah. Um, by yeah. the way, um, have you read Tom Holt's book, Meadowland? No, I don't think I have, no. I strongly I recommend it. It's, it's comic historical fiction uh, by Holt has a classics degree. And this is the story of the settlement of the, you know, the, the Greenlanders who made it over to North America. Yes. And there's so much about life on those ships in there, but told from a kind of comic perspective. Um, and what's fascinating is that the story is told by two Varangian guardsmen, like in uh, who are old, yeah, to yeah. a eunuch, and as they're, uh, you know, uh, on a journey out from Constantinople. Uh, that's why I read it because it has this connection. And anyway, it's great fun. Meadowland. I, I will write it down. Yeah. And, uh, and I will look for why empires fall in the fall. Yes. Right. Yes. Uh, Peter, thank you very much for coming on. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's been, uh, we've corresponded off and on. And I haven't realized we've been in the same room, but now it, it's been great fun having a chance to talk. <laughs> yeah, at least once. All right. Take yes. care. Well, hopefully there'll be more in the future. <laughs>